suis. Welcome everybody to Chaps Mini Cultures, episode 127. Today we're going to talk about whether your schedule is super tight and whether you keep a really strict regimen on how you segment your daily activities or whether you're a little bit more relaxed and flexible around how things happen to you in life and in work. Stay tuned. How about this? If I could find time in a bottle, first thing that I'd like to do. <laughs> one of the things, well, where is the time in your bottle? One of the many songs about time. Yeah. Well, we're not going to do the time warp, right? Or is, is it's, it's astounding. Just it's astounding. It's astounding. Time is fleeting. Madness takes its toll <laughs> many times. <laughs> All the millennials watching this are wondering, what are these geezers talking about? We, we're just dating ourselves, Brett. I had to close so, the door. <laughs> yeah, you clo close the door so time does not escape. Um, now, the sticklers for time amongst you may be wondering, did they not announce this episode to start at 15 minutes past the hour? They started three minutes late. Yes, we did. Yes. And still, you're here. And we are thankful that you're here because this is Two Japs Many Cultures, the program about the business of culture and the culture of business. And today our topic is time. How do we perceive it? How do we view it? How do we control it? Or does it control us? Ooh, so many Ooh. questions to ponder. Brett, are you controlled by time? Yeah, well, I think I am. But I don't, you know, that's the point. Uh, can I control it or can, does it control me? Um, the time really doesn't control anything, does it? Time just comes and goes. It doesn't really give a crap about us. <laughs> it just comes and goes. Time passes. Um, some cultures, time doesn't even exist. I mean, it's not even a construct in the Gregorian sense that we think about it. Uh, you know, date, dates and time and calendars and things like this. Uh, you know, just life comes and it goes. And... Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting topic and it comes up a lot when we're talking with people that that may not even think of uh, what they're experiencing is a time construct, but their relationship with their global colleagues and even their, their colleagues they sit next to um, and uh, how they perceive the responses they get back from people is all governed by what our perception of time is and what we think, how we treat time. So um, it can touch a lot of areas. Right. And Karen here says we're busted. Um, well, that 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 would be true if, and of course it is true, Karen. I'm not going to make you wrong. However, I don't feel busted. See, there is because for me, time is it's fluid. It tends to be fluid. Sure. Do I expect to be on time myself? Do I expect others to be on time? To a certain degree, yes. And my wife will tell you, um, she's also German, she will tell you that I am notoriously late. And yes, Karen, thank you for calling that out. Um, <laughs> however, even though I'm German, to me, being 100% punctual on the dot on the second will does, does not matter as much to me as you might think, or as some might think. Right. Hmm. It doesn't matter to me if it's going to be like five minutes late and you don't tell me where you are and we set up to meet somewhere and there is no notification. Then I begin to worry. And if you don't show up 15 minutes late without notifying me, then I'll be out the room and you will, whether you're looking for me or not, you won't find me. Um, Karen is only semi embarrassed to admit. All right, good. <laughs> she was checking her watch. Where are you? All right. So it does matter to her a little bit. So um, th this this 
when it comes to punctuality when we view time or when we talk about the perception of time a lot of it in cross-cultural uh, aspects it, it's this question that comes up in trainings how punctual are the people that I will be working with or interacting with how much does punctuality matter to them how strict are they around scheduling and mm. this is a, a tricky question because there is no easy answer to this so some might tell you well when you work with the germans you better be on time or with the swiss you know they make those watches you gotta be on time you gotta be early otherwise you won't be on time that might generally speaking be true to a certain extent now, i just told you how i view it so i'm not your quote unquote typical german right so it does not the, the nationality as we said many times over on this program doesn't necessarily predict behavior the passport mm -hmm. doesn't tell you how somebody will act but there are general trends obviously right so for germanic cultures german speakers um timeliness and, and tightness around the perception of time are a an observable trend i would i would admit even though I may not always adhere to that. What is it like in Australia? You're, you're the outlier. Well, I think we, because we come from uh, a cult, we, well, I come from a culture that is seen on many of the cultural measurements as being independent. So people might be seen as, I guess, having a precious commodity uh, as, or treating time as a precious commodity, something that we need to, um, you know, control or at least have control of in our life and have some plans. It's not as to the extent as that. It is, uh, there's a little bit more, I guess I would call it, you know, fatalism. If something else comes up that might look a little bit more fun, you know, shiny penny. I mean, I'm speaking from my own experience. I'm a little bit like that myself. But um, in general, I think that there is a, a little bit more of a looser sense of time, but also the idea that people that approach or work with my uh, people from my country are sometimes put off with the fact that maybe there's a little bit of a delay. We've all, we, we also, I also say that we have an affinity with the Latin American type of mindset, which is a stereotype that we, a lot of people hold that everything is manana. So we might have that, but that's not necessarily true. It is because it's like having a relationship, somebody who's close to you demanding your time takes precedence over somebody outside of the sphere of your immediate uh, purview mm. asking for your time, if that makes sense. It's kind of like yeah. you, 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 you have a relationship with these people. So um, even though I may have a commitment with somebody that's outside of my normal purview that I don't know that well and that's fine, um, then, you know, as soon as somebody comes along who's kind of a closer acquaintance or a friend, um, I will possibly make an excuse to the person that I don't know that well that I have something else important to take care of. So, so you, you would do that too um, in Australia? That would be a, a, an acceptable behavior in Australia, which I yeah. often think, and I'm, I'm not quite sure if, if this is just a working theory, if there's some empiric evidence for that. But I wonder, since Australia is such a huge continent, huge landmass, which is fairly uh, sparsely populated, aside from some of the coastal areas, and there's some some real struggle, or, or I don't want to say struggle, but there, there, the 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 relationship between the land and the people is is can be uh, harsh at times, right? There, there are natural disruptions to human behavior. Hmm. Um, I would I would suspect that has an effect on how people how, how closely people uh, allow themselves to regulate time because there are variables in your day to day that you cannot control as a human right so the aspect of how much am I as an individual or as a group of people how much are we in control how much can we actually determine our tightness in in scheduling. And that might be easier in areas that are um, heavily developed, where, where we as humans have put a, a strong imprint on it, or where we have made the world in our to our liking, or we, we made the world the way we want it to be. And, and there are other parts of the world where nature is, is stronger controlling how humans interact with it. Therefore, time cannot be as tightly managed. Is that 
just my yeah. imagination or is there evidence to that? Yeah, well, I had this discussion the other day with somebody who said that they feel that Australia is way behind the US and other places in, far, in terms of innovation. You know, things, they don't, they, there's not a lot of startups, there's not a lot of innovation. The, I would argue that it's, there, there's plenty of innovation in Australia. There's plenty of people that come out of Australia that cause innovation. We've, we've you know, we've, we've had our fair share of inventions over the years. But I guess that I would say that in the US, because there is a shorter, there's sense to, there tends to be a, a demand that things happen much faster and there's a high tolerance for risk if, if it doesn't turn out perfectly the first time, therefore we can go back and do it. Whereas maybe in the Australian, and again, we're just talking about Australia here, but it can uh, apply to other cultures, is that there is a sense that, yes, we can do innovation, but, you know, we might want to have a beer and think about it first. The, you know, they're, 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 so it might give the impression that the innovation doesn't exist, but I would argue it does. It just uh, exists in a slower time time motion. You know, it's uh, it's stretched out. So there's not the urgency for mm -hmm. quick satisfaction um, to to prove ourselves. You know that that we can do it as fast and as well as possible. We do it. We do it at our own pace, um, but that's even faster than other cultures still. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I think there are the various factors that, that uh, change a culture's attitude towards time. I think when we go back 300 years, when we don't have uh, cultural assessments, where we don't have data that measures group behavior, um, science has only begun doing that in the 20th century maybe anthropologist in the late 19th century, sure. Uh, but w w when we go back to uh, pre-industrial times, pre-enlightenment times, we, we don't have that type of data available. So it, it's hard mm -hmm. to say, but I would argue that um, industrialization played a role or the degree to, to which a society is industrialized plays a role in how we view time. Um, I would argue that at least from a European Western perspective, the religious or the Christian schism that happened with the Reformation changed it a little bit. Um, I, I would argue that, that predominantly Catholic cultures are a little bit more relaxed around scheduling and timing and Protestant societies tend to be a little bit more rigid around this because Catholic societies think, well, I'll be judged upon my life's work as I stand uh, before the gates of Peter and then in the afterlife I will be judged and Protestants tend to view it as well my success my yeah my success and what I accomplished during my lifetime on earth is a reflection of my holiness or my godlike or the behavior that God or the the, the deity wants me to have right so my success in, during my lifetime is a reflection of me being an observant believer of my faith. So that is, is all these are traditions that have come through through Protestantism that live on in, in Protestant societies, right? Yeah. Um, um, and Joe, Joe Lurie asks us whether we've seen, what does ASAP mean? Well, we shall watch that right after. And what does ASAP mean? What's the ac what does the acronym stand for, Brett? As soon as possible, yeah. As but as maybe possible. that will blow up. Maybe the, the video will blow up our idea of what ASAP means. That's maybe. Good, well, well, thanks for sharing that, Joe. We, we shall yeah. watch it right after this. Um, Absolutely. Thank so you, Joe. What, what, good to see you, man. What, yes. We should have her on, don't you think? We should. <laughs> we, should we should have Joe on. So. Get ready, Joe. We're coming for you. Um, yeah, and by the, by the way. There you go. <laughs> we See? will talk about this. This is, this is a great book. And, and uh, Joe was kind enough to give me, um, yeah, to, you know, perception again. Yeah, perception and deception, right? Oh, you bring up that. I mean, the word deception. Does somebody who I'm sorry if I'm throwing you off a topic here, sure. Christian, but bring if somebody it. is, but but if somebody is seems to be not responding in a in a certain way or a certain timely manner, does that mean they're being deceptive or they're hiding something? There's another. There's another thing in the works. Maybe we can wait for Joe to explain that to us. That, that's another de a deception of the perception that we, we see of other people's view of time and their relationship to it. Well, I think many cross-cultural hiccups 
uh, emerge because of mismanaged expectations, right? One side expects a certain behavior that would fall in line with their default, and it does not, in fact, then fall in line with that. So the normal that I like to put in air quotations is not the same on each side. So you have one side that expects to be the, the punctual side. So we had a meeting at 3 p.m. and you're not showing up. But the other side says, well, I was at lunch with a business contact, a business partner. And over lunch, we had this amazing idea that turns into a big opportunity for both of us. So this became more important than my 3 p.m. I'm still honoring my 3 p.m. I'll be there at 3.20. I'm sorry that I'm a little late, but you'll understand, right? Because you're an important contact to me as well. You understand how important it is to um, work this out and it will potentially also affect the way we work together. Well, that's one view of the story, right? The other view is, well, you said 3 p.m., you're not here, you're disrespecting me. So yeah. how would I like to continue working with you in the future if you can't be on time for this one? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> And then, of course, if somebody is late, I mean, and I, I was just thinking as you were saying that, um, so listening to your, that narrative that you just laid out there, if I'm on the receiving end of that, the other thing that I guess would frustrate me is that somebody who turns up late already, 20 minutes late, but then spends another 20 minutes telling me why they're late which is also, we're late already, so we're, we're, we're already, but then they feel the justification to explain to me the ins and outs of a, of a rat's bum hole just to, just to let me know that they're sorry. And really, you know, quite frankly, I don't care. I mean, I'm really interested in, you know, I'm interested in doing what I'm committed to for this person. So I'm hoping that, you know, possibly let's just get down to business, especially unless I've got nothing else on afterwards. I tend to plan my stuff with, uh, gaps between. I try to do that. And then I still find that no matter how much I try and do that, uh, you know, t love has always kind of worked out, but there's always this kind of jigsaw puzzle approach to it, right? Uh, it seems to all fit in. And then if there's anything else I just want to do that's spontaneous, it's hard for me to do. At what point do you feel that you're late? Let's say you had the 3 p.m. At, at what point um, is late for you? No, oh, I hate being late at all. I mean, I just don't like being late if I'm if I've got another person relying on my arrival. I I just hate it. I do, I do, I feel that I've um, disrespected them. You know, I feel that that commitment I've made, and um, and oftentimes I will, you know, I'll, I'll take the blame myself too. You know, maybe this is a this is something that's a kind of a self deprecating thing, is that I won't explain. You know, somebody else let me down, and you know. I have to explain that away. I'll say, you know, I just, you know, there is that thing about saying sorry about this. And we do, we did an episode on apologizing. Is it, is the, there is a sense that people say, stop saying sorry about being late. Stop being, just say, thank you for waiting. or Thank you for spending the time waiting, right? Mm -hmm. There's another, you know, it's a, it's a gratitude approach that you understand that you may have put them out for the 10 or 15 minutes that you're late. And that is really something that you, it's not about you and your sorry, sorrowfulness. It's about your gratitude that they've been um, willing to wait for you and, and uh, give you that grace. So, you know, these are, these are small things and maybe NLP has some of this kind of stuff that you do. I don't know whether that's in it, but it's basically, you know, giving the other person the, the uh, giving them the face, right? Understanding without, without kind of diminishing your, importance i don't know i don't know really what i'm trying to say there but yeah I, I mean i've been telling our clients uh that yes it's important to avoid mishaps it's a, it's important to um don't step into people on onto people's toes when you work across cultures however you will inevitably make mistakes. It, we're humans, none of us are perfect. So there will be a time when we are late or when we do not meet somebody else's expectations in terms of behavior. So I think the, the more important question uh, rather than how to avoid the mistake is how do I repair the relationship? How do I make amends for behavior that was not aligned, right? So in, in, in my case, if I'm late, how do I mitigate the fallout? How do I repair the 
the breaking of a trust or or I, whatever it may be that causes discomfort between people. So for mm -hmm. me, when, when I know that I will be late, I will do whatever is in my power to let the other party know, whether it's through a phone call or a text message, email, whatever it may be, saying, hey, I know we were supposed to meet at three. I won't be able to make it. Um, thank you for waiting. I'll, and here is my estimated time of arrival. And is that still okay? Will that still be work? Will that still work for you? If not, um, I'm I'm ready to reschedule. So mm. that is my approach. Does that always work? Not sure. Um, how, how can you repair the damage, Brett? Yeah, I, I think that it is a. Um, I feel a sense of obligation after that to then you know over deliver even on more than what I promised in the first place. So it can affect on what you feel your obligation to this person is, which can be, it, you know, I, I would say if you are constantly late and it's part of your normal construct, maybe people that have that approach, which is not wrong or right, it's, it's just the way that people are. That's not a fault. It's just a way that you live your life. So therefore they release themselves of the obligation of having to feel like they have to, to repair it at all. Right. And right. so the person on the receiving end of that feels, well, now that that person's late, they kind of owe me something. So therefore, I'm going to use that as leverage in the future. When they do that, it comes as a surprise to the person who, who has done that. Right. And then they feel, well, why are you saying that? You know, we, I still got there. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. It's a very, very complicated. This is why it's clear all the time, just to bring it some clarity around this. It's always clear to at least maybe have these discussions with your new global colleagues or even your domestic colleagues to say, this is the way I know I am, right? And you can do it in a self-deprecating way. You can do it. If you set the expectations ahead of time uh, to say, this is what I commit to doing, like if I'm not somebody who does like what you do, that makes the time to, to call ahead and say, listen, I'm going to be a little bit late. If, you, if you're not somebody that's done that, but you know you're working with people that would appreciate that, then, you know, make a mental note or even a physical note to say, hey, if I am going to be late, I, I do need to do this with this person. Again, not we're trying, we're not trying to change your own personality or own sense of being. We're just saying that it is worth taking these small little steps in the, in the sense of style switching in uh, when it relates to time or anything else um that you can you, you can maybe avoid some of this you know it doesn't mean that your colleagues might not get frustrated it doesn't it certainly yeah. they they might but at least you've set these expectations people are clear about what they know it takes out the the um uh the ambiguity yeah and i think oftentimes this mutual understanding of how we will be as a group, as a team, as a company, how we will be viewing time is, is defined by people in, in positions of authority or leadership positions, right? Mm. Um, if, if, you, if you're the owner of a meeting and the meeting involves three or more people and you start at the agreed time and somebody comes in late and they will notice that the meeting's already in progress, that will send the message that they will know in the future I will miss out on maybe decisions that I that affect me if I'm not there on time or worse yet I might be reprimanded by a superior who notices my tardiness so that that could set an example right uh, it could also set the example that there is an agreed time and we give I don't know a grace period and that may be the corporate culture or the group culture that yes we say 3 p.m. but um, we're we're gonna chit chat a little bit for five minutes until we get into the meat of things. Um, ironically, some cultures have different standards for different circumstances. And going back to my native culture, Germany, in business context, it is quite expected that 3 p.m. means 3:00 and not 3:01. In an academic con uh, context in Germany, there is still the the idea of the academic quarter, the academic 15. So um, lectures in Ger German universities tend to be scheduled from, let's say, 3 to 5 p.m. I'm making this up. But mm -hmm. the, uh, the lecturer, the docent, will not begin until 3.15. And that is the, the buffer period um, for larger campuses to allow students to arrive and settle. I, I don't know what the exact 
background to this is I myself wondered about this. The minute I left high school in Germany where there was a, a, a bell ringing at the hour or at the end of a lesson period, it was clearly structured with auditory signals that, hey, this is when it starts, this is when it ends. And then I came to university just to recognize, well, it's at 3 p.m., but people are still sitting down. Where's the professor? Nobody started yet. Until I recognized, okay, this is another concept of time. Mm. Dueling ideas within the same culture. Who knew? Yeah. I found, I found it interesting, just as a side note, of listening to, uh, again, my great mentor, Ben Zander, describe and, and pick apart a piece of music and say, this, ha this has to be played faster in order for it to appear slower. And, and when he demonstrated it, it was amazing. I just thought, I've never thought of it that way. There are, there are some pieces of music that in, you know, he was, he was saying the person that was playing it was, ex was dragging it, right? It would seem to be dragging. And they said, but it's supposed to be played slow. He said, yes, but the, the composer didn't write it that way. The composer wrote it at this particular time signature. And let me play it for you, and I will show you how it seems to slow down when you play it faster. It was amazing. Um, anyway, so that's an aside. Wait, so that, that, that reminds me. Really, that, yeah, that reminds me of that movie that I think either you or one of the guests here said. I need you need to watch that movie Ford versus Ferrari. Oh and right. Yeah. So I did watch it um, over over the break, and sure enough, there's this one scene where the driver explains to his son that as you drive at two hundred or more miles per hour as you're going very fast and you don't have tunnel vision but peripheral vision everything around you seems to be slowing down as you are going very fast like okay time is oh, yeah, relative yeah. einstein yeah. will have a field day with us they they would and how often do you hear people that are in accidents that say they can describe the that, I mean, it happens in an instant, but they can describe. I think this is a fascinating thing, not related to actually again turning up for meetings. You don't want to be having an accident on your way to a meeting, but oh. it is a sense of that. You know, the the mind does funny things with time. The mind, you know, and then of course you've got the wonderful uh, Aboriginal um, uh, civilization that exists in my country. The time really doesn't have any clocks. It it, it is there is the dream time and there is now and and that is it and. Uh, and and it doesn't have any construct. There is no calendar. There is no sense of history. You know, we measure them as the oldest, you know, society on earth, 40 to 60,000 years. And they go, yeah, we don't even know what that looks like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I think that this this idea of of scheduling the future, of, of predicting what will happen or, or regulating what will happen, I think this is in parts at least a product of industrialization so we managed to control um light with electricity we managed to produce um things on a conveyor belt system so now we can make it daylight 24 7 at least in controlled spaces and we can we have enough energy to, to do this 24 seven. So sure, you guys got to sleep, but so you come in eight hours and then you guys come in the next eight hours. And by the way, we have another group over here. You fill in the third eight hours. So now time becomes regulated. Now humans develop this concept of, hey, I'm in charge of time. Ergo, I know what will happen because if we continue doing this, I will have produced X amount of things by the end of the week. And when I do this, I will sell these X amount of things to X amount of people. So I am projecting stuff into the future, which other cultures don't do because they live in the moment right now because that's the only time that truly exists. The past already gone. The future is about to happen, but we are in the now moment so how we view that how we see ourselves on that ticker i think is also quite um interesting that because it affects how we behave in certain situations absolutely and so we thank you for giving us some of your, your time. time yes for some reason i feel like <laughs> i was supposed to have something now i'm supposed to be holding something uh, karen i'm coming over to get your watch <laughs> yeah karen says she's well, if I'm not there and ready to go at three, then I'm like, yeah, I guess Karen is a prefers to have it on, yes. on the dock. Okay, good. 
That's why we know uh, Karen, who does what she does so well as the admin of CTA USA, keeps us all on our toes and uh, tells us exactly where to be and what to do at that certain time. And some of us need that, certainly me. But, um, you know, that, <laughs> but that, is, that is the idea that people say that is that I'm giving you some of my time or can I have some of your time? Can I take a moment of your time? Well, there's nothing really, there, there's a sense of uh, transaction there. I'm not sure that anything really passes hands, but uh, we're, that, that's a, again, it's a, it's a mental construct that we say, uh, we feel like we traded something. We feel like we traded something tangible. Yeah. And other right. people might say, well, it's not, not so important, but anyway, another discussion. Thank you very much, everybody, um, for Thanks. sticking around episode 127, right? Seven. So time is up now for us, and we will see all of you again tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.